Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. It is a privilege to gather this morning for worship here at Orchard Community Church. Greetings to those of you joining us online. Greetings to those of you in the, on the patio and greetings to those of you here joining us in the worship building in person. Uh, if I haven't had the opportunity to meet you yet, my name is Matt. I'm the pastor here at Orchard and we sure are glad that you are here. I don't know what your week was like. Perhaps this was a wonderful week and you're flying high. Maybe this was a terrible week and you're really dragging yourself in here. What I do know is that God is faithful and that's why we worship. Amen? Amen. Let's, uh, let's pray as we open our service together. Loving God, guide our hearts and minds as we worship you this day. Let us be filled with your praises. Let us proclaim the good things you have done. You have made us and you love us. You have rescued us from sin. You've filled our hearts with hope. May our worship glorify and honor you in every way. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing. Wondering if I could change It's when you're hiding all alone Your heart can turn into a stone To the light. There's no place I'd rather be. Your light is marvelous. Your light is marvelous. You have come to set us free. You are marvelous. Your light is marvelous to me. So I walk down. Into the light, from fear of shame into the hope of life. Mercy called my name and made a way to fly out of the darkness and into the light. Let's sing that one more time. So I walk out of the darkness and into the light, from fear of shame into the hope of life. Mercy called my name and made a way to fly out of the darkness and into the light. Amen. Into the light. Please be seated. Well, friends, as always, you can find a digital bulletin for this service on the U version of Bible app. There's links to that in our weekly email and on our website. Um, if you scroll to the top of the page, those of you joining us online, there's a button that will open that bulletin up for you right there. Uh, if you're here in person, uh, we'd love to direct you to our paper bulletin. There's a perforated card that you can tear off. We'd love for you to sign that and put it in the basket when it goes around. That would let us know that you were here. And if there's a prayer request, we'd love uh, for you to share that with us if you'd like, and we'd be praying 
praying for you uh, this week. I uh, want to just continue to direct you to uh, your bulletin. Uh, we've got a lot of great things going on at the 9 o'clock hour for um, adults and youth and children. So take a look and see what's just right for you. I know that uh, many of you are aware that we are in the process of uh, forming a new position to bring in an assistant pastor here at Orchard. I mentioned that a number of weeks ago. There's an article in the Orchard Life about that from me. But I wanted to just introduce to you the PNC. That's the Pastor Nominating Committee. They're the interview group. Um, they are chaired by Luann Smith, and that uh, committee consists of Dia Jacobs, David Pels, Judy Alexander, Rudy, uh, Randy Metz, Bar Barry Reagan, and myself. So those are the folks that are going to be involved in that, and you can look for periodic updates from the PNC over the next several months. Um, moving on, I wanted to mention our deacons have a memorial fund that's a, a memorial form that's available, um, and they have that for you to fill out, uh, and, and you can keep that on file um, with the church uh, in the event of your memorial service uh, to pick out uh, what you'd like to have happen at that service, and they want you to be aware that we have that option available for you, so know that that can happen. Well, the women's retreat is coming up in February on the 23rd to the 25th. Sign-ups are happening right now. I want to encourage you to be a part of that. It's in the solvang Bulton area. Um, today, we are receiving those thank you cards that we're making for the community. If you've got those, go ahead and pop them in the basket when I come around. I think there might still be time to turn some in if you didn't get it done. Um, uh, talk to Judy Alexander about that. Today we have a meet and greet, um, luncheon following the service. For those who are newer to Orchard, we'd love to invite you. Um, even if this is your first Sunday, uh, we'd love to invite you to stay after uh, and have lunch with us in the library. It's just a, an opportunity to get to know you, for you to get to know uh, myself and some of our key leaders. And there's a very short presentation on Orchard just to help you feel oriented and find your way. So again, in the library, um, right across the patio behind us, We'd love to invite you to be a part of that. A few things coming up to just keep on your radar screen. We have a movie night coming up on September 22nd. The Opportunity Fair is next Sunday. So following worship all out on the patio will be the different ministries um, of the church for you to find out about and to volunteer if you'd like to. Um, the Shredded event is coming up on September 30th. And uh, I think that's right. It's the 30th, right? Not the 20. I wanted to, I terribly wanted to say the 29th, but I restrained myself. So those are the things that are going on. Um, at this point, I want to invite Jerry to come forward, and Jerry has our kids' message for today. Thank you, Jerry. Okay, good morning. Yeah, I'm uh, Jerry Horsmeyer, and I'm a volunteer in the uh, Orchard Sunday Kids uh, program. So if we could have the kids, so the kids come up to the front here. Well, this morning, um, we're going to go through a story about a person named Joseph. And uh, one of the things about Joseph is he had a number of brothers. So do you all, let's see, have how many brothers? Let's see. Uh, and this is for the, the whole group out there. Um, how many have at least one brother that you grew up with? Okay. Well, we'll count up and keep your hand raised if you go two, Three, four, five, <laughs> six, we got to stand up for this, seven, all right, seven, eight, 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 nine, okay, well, Joseph had 11 brothers. And uh, for those of you who have brothers, uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure that every day of every hour, you all got, got along with your brothers, right? Never any arguments, never any uh, hard feelings and that. Well, um, Joseph's uh, brothers were not so nice to him. And uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about that when we go um, down in, in our lesson. And, um, but the thing about Joseph is that he was able to, in all these troubles and things, he was able to keep his faith and connection uh, with God. And so the, the adults here and everybody staying here is also going to uh, study about keeping your faith even when uh, suffering occurs. So um, let me say a short prayer for us. 
Uh, Lord, we're just so thankful that we can uh, gather together, and we ask for your blessing on the uh, kids' program uh, as we connect with you, and uh, help to guide us so that we may uh, maintain our faith even uh, when we're suffering. We pray these things through Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Okay, kids, we're going to go out the door to the program. Just a, a little... Um History on this. This is a new arrangement of an old hymn that was written in 1874 by Frances Ridley Havergal. Um, and she wrote that when she was 14, she committed my soul to, my, to the Savior, and earth and heaven seemed brighter from that moment. So as a young person growing up in the church, this was one of the hymns that con connected uh, with me the most. Um, as you listen to the words, I'm sure it will be familiar for many of you, um, but it is a practical prayer, and I feel like we can sing this and pray these words um, that our whole life um, be used by God. Um, my hands, my feet, my voice, my heart, my will, my mind, um, to me, it's like a prayerful spiritual checklist. Um, so take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Let this be your prayer this week. Isn't it great how our little church has such a magnificent choir? <laughs> Thanks, choir, for lifting that up today. That was really wonderful. 
For those of you that don't know me, my name is Joy Downing Riley. I'm a worship elder here at our church. I serve with Del Watson, Pastor Matt, June Verloop, and Corey Verloop, and Jamie McDonald. And I'm here today to announce to you our upcoming prayer and healing service, which is happening Thursday, October 19th from 6.30 to 7.30 here in the worship building. We've prepared a guide leading up to that service to help you get prepared to understand more about what healing prayer is. Long ago, about 20 years ago, I was not prepared for my own healing experience. I was invited to go to a prayer conference in Salt Lake City, Utah, and I wanted to learn more about prayer. During the conference in the morning, the prayer leader stood up and said, during the time she was teaching, you know what, I really feel strongly God is going to heal somebody with a brain injury. And I thought to myself, oh, cool, I have a brain injury. That is so cool that someone's going to be healed. So I shared with my lunch lady friends that um, I had a brain injury, and they were like, oh, cool. And so um, not seeing what was coming, the same prayer lady who was teaching stopped in the middle of her teaching and said, I don't know who this person is, but the Holy Spirit really wants to heal someone with a brain injury. Still, I was kind of clueless, didn't know it was me. I was like, great, I can't wait to see for this person to be healed. And then she says straight out loud, my diagnosis from my neurologist. And I knew God had my number. So really, it was only my husband, my doctor, and the Lord, obviously, knew what my diagnosis was. So I walked up to the front. Um, the prayer leader lifted her hand toward me. I was literally six feet away from her. And all of a sudden, I found myself lying on the floor with the power of God ministering to me. Of course, I had all kinds of Presbyterian questions in my mind. <laughs> How long do you lay on the floor in someone else's church with people you don't know? Wow, these floorboards are kind of uneven. <laughs> so from that moment on, God sent me on a journey, sent me to East Africa to do prayer and healing ministry there, to seminary, which I tell you was way harder than doing prayer and healing ministry in East Africa to this day. So I just want to share with you a question. It's very important, but it's serious. I want to ask you all, do we want to be healed? Do we want to walk in wholeness with the Lord? Well, this guide will help you and give you a little direction on your journey. Um, it's divided into four port parts. You can do um, a section each day for four weeks leading up to the prayer and healing service. So um, just a warning, when I had Pastor Matt look at this, he goes, wow, <laughs> this is kind of deep. Um, eat your Wheaties for the first section each day. And if you ran out of Wheaties and you don't have time, there's a section at the end that summarizes all the points about prayer and healing service. So on October 19, please bring yourselves, your creaky bones, your diseases, your heartaches, your grief, your friends who are sick, and we're going to see God at work. Lord, we come to your house today to worship you. You created the universe and all that's in it. The word, your word tells us that we are created in your image. Lord, we confess that we have failed to live up to your image. We often think of ourselves before we think of others. We do not always honor your name in our speech and in our actions. We often do not do unto others as we would do unto ourselves. But we are thankful, Lord, that you have made a way for us to become more in your image through your son, Jesus Christ, and through the Holy Spirit. We thank you that we can find forgiveness. We can find new beginnings. We can find our way in life through your love for us. It's through you, Lord, that we find our purpose for our lives. We find meaning. We find hope. We can find these things nowhere else but in you. We humbly ask, Lord, that you open our eyes to our divine purpose. Open our eyes, open our minds to find true meaning and our hearts to find your hope. Please give us strength. Please give us healing. Please give us wisdom to carry your word to our neighbors and to the nations. In closing, I will 
pray a prayer confession that's prayed at uh, the Presbyterian Church in Ashton, North Carolina. God, our creator, we confess that we are people of ashes and dust. You have claimed us in your covenant, yet we forget your steadfast love. You seek us out in the wilderness, yet we continue to wander in our sin. Wash us clean once again, so that we may return to you and follow your holy way. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. We can have our ushers come forward. It's our time for offering. Stand and sing with us. All of my devotion. Now there's nothing in this world that can never satisfy. Through every trial, my soul will sing, no turning back. I've been set free.
have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. I keep fighting voices in my head that say I'm not enough. And every single lie that tells me I will God loves us so much. Please be seated. I want to start this morning with a video. So, Carol, can you roll that for us? Watch this. Do I have three Super Bowl rings? I mean, and maybe, and still think there's something greater out there for me. I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey, man, this is what it is. I reached my goal, my dream, my life is me. I thank God. It's got to be more than this. I mean, this isn't. This can't be what it's all cracked up to be. I mean, I've done it. I'm 27. And what else is there for me? What's the answer? I wish I knew. I wish I knew. I mean, it's... I think that's part of me ex trying to go out and experience other things. But there's a... I know I love playing football, and I love being the quarterback for this team. And But at the same time, I think there's a lot of other parts about me that I'm trying to find. dating a supermodel who he eventually married. And by most measures of success, I think people would have looked at him and said, uh, here's a guy who has everything that a person could possibly want, 
And yet here he is on 60 Minutes saying, there's got to be more than this. And it might seem odd to us at first that this person who, who has basically everything that a person could want still, even then, is feeling unfulfilled. But you know, it's actually not so strange if we really think about it, because all that Tom Brady was doing was struggling with the same life issue that all of us have to deal with as we make our way through this life. And that, that question is, um, what truly gives life meaning? In fact, throughout the generations, there's been a couple of questions around meaning that people have historically sought to answer. And one of them is, does my life have any meaning? Does life itself or my life have any meaning? And then the second question is, does what I do matter? Those two key questions of meaning. So hold on to those. Let's take a look at the first one. So there was this time when some of the religious scholars of the day, the Pharisees, came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, tell us what is the greatest commandment in the scripture? And this was a huge question, of course, because the Jewish people were very faithful and they thought of their, their, their scripture, the law, the Old Testament, as we would refer to it, as the most important thing in life next to God. In fact, the, the rabbis, the Jewish teachers of that time had a saying, and the saying was, Torah is life. That's the Old Testament. They called it the Torah. Torah is life because it's how, the, how we know about God. It's that important. So when these religious scholars came to Jesus and they said, tell us what the most important commandment in the Torah is, it was kind of like they were saying to Jesus, tell us what the meaning of life is. And you may remember Jesus' answer. Jesus responds saying that the greatest commandment is to love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And then he gives them a second commandment to piggyback on that, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. And so there was a very real sense in which Jesus was saying in that moment that the greatest meaning in this life is to be found in relationship. First and foremost in our relationship with God, because nothing gives our lives meaning, greater meaning than knowing God and his plan for our life. But also, meaning is found in our relationships with others, and not just the people that we love. Jesus basically says that even in the way that we relate to other human beings, to all other human beings, there's something significant and important. There's a source of meaning in that for all of us. So today we are continuing on in our series of messages called Authentic Faith, as you know, based on the book of Philippians. And we've been talking about how there are so many expressions of faith in this world that fall really painfully short of what we would hope for in our lives. Um, we want our faith, we don't, we don't want a faith that's plastic or fake. We don't want a faith that's just for show for other people or a faith that's just going through the motions or becomes arrogant or cookie cutter or so many other lesser things that we could think of. We, we would really like a faith that's authentic. Authentic means real. It means genuine. It means true what we're really after is a real relationship with God lived in an honest way. And in the book of Philippians, we have this amazing snapshot <clears throat> of the life of the Apostle Paul. And what we see in this book is that as Paul lived in and taught, there's just something, um, this authentic quality, something natural and genuine about the way he lived and the things he taught. It's compelling and so this fall, we're looking at the book of Philippians to see how we can live an authentic life. <clears throat> we took a break last week and heard from Nita Hansen. Wasn't she wonderful? Just what a faithful woman. But the two weeks prior to that, we began and we looked at the first part of chapter one of Philippians. <clears throat> and I think one of the things that you can see if you look back is that what, G what Paul was teaching was really grounded <clears throat> in what Jesus had taught. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, could I trouble someone to get me a cup of water? Because um, I uh, apparently have a frog that won't go away. So if we look back over the first part of Philippians chapter 1, 
um, we find that, that Jesus, what Paul was teaching was really based on what Jesus was teaching. So in, in week one, Paul framed our faith. You'll remember this. He framed our faith in terms of a word called ko- uh, koinonia, a Greek word koinonia. It, um, it can mean partnership. That's how it was translated. That's our word, week one word. It can mean sharing. It can mean community. It's a word that is always relational. So Paul framed our faith in terms of relationships. And remember that the thing that Paul Paul was most excited about the Philippians about in that first chapter was that they understood this, that they understood. Thank you so much, friend. Paul was appreciated that the, that the Philippians got that, that they understood that this faith we live is a relational faith, live together in partnership with God, and that they had partnered with Paul in his ministry. So week two, what we saw was Paul had this amazing perspective, and this perspective that Paul had uh, allowed him to weather the very difficult storms of life in a, in a pretty amazing way. And, and what we found was that Paul's unique spiritual perspective was grounded in his faith in God. And by staying grounded in his faith in God, what Paul remo- what was constantly reminded him of is who God is and who he was, that he was someone made and loved by God. And that kept Paul from falling into the trap of being defined by his circumstances. So relationship, faith as relationship, spiritual perspective as relationship, this is all uh, the same kind of, of, of thing that Jesus talked about, that meaning is found in these relationships. And so uh, Paul uh, calls us to, to stay grounded in, um, in our faith as well so that we'll have that same spiritual perspective. So it's clear that what Paul has said so far has been based on um, Jesus teaching about the greatest meaning of our lives being found in relationship. So we've kind of dealt with, if you think about it, we've kind of dealt with that first question. Does life have meaning? And the resounding answer is yes, it has meaning. And the greatest meaning of this life is to be found in relationship, relationship with God and relationship with one another. So now in the last few verses, actually the last three verses of this passage, Paul's going to take on that second question of meaning. And that second question is, does what I do matter? And Paul's answer to that question is a resounding yes. What you do matters and it matters a lot because authentic faith leads us to consistently live this life God's way. Pray with me. Lord, we pray that you'd speak to us about our lives, about what we do, about the meaning of what we do. Does it really matter, Lord? Um, speak to each one of us, Lord, in the, in the stillness of our hearts and the questions of our minds uh, about how we might live this life for you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's take a look at Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 through 30. So just the last three verses of chapter 1. And uh, Paul writes this there. He says, Whatever happens... Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come to see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, um, but that you will be saved uh, and, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggles you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. So the passage begins in verse 27 with this little phrase. Paul says, whatever happens. And this is a kind of a transitional phrase. It it marks the Um, transition from Paul talking for a bit about what we believe, and now he's going to talk about how we live what we believe, and it, it transitions right there. And Paul begins here with the subject of our conduct, only Paul does something here kind of out of the ordinary, for himself and for for biblical writers. So normally when Paul and other biblical writers would talk about our conduct, they would use the Jewish metaphor of walking. It's a metaphor we still use today. If you talk about your spiritual life as your spiritual walk. 
or if you talk about walking with Jesus, we are actually using a Jewish metaphor that is thousands of years old. And so what we would uh, expect Paul to say here is walk in a way that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. That, w- that would be the most typical way that Paul would say what he says here, but that's not what Paul says. Paul uses a different word here, and it's really interesting. The word that's translated as conduct, it's a vo- verbal form of the Greek word polities, which means citizen. And so Paul is kind of saying something like citizen in a manner worthy of the gospel, or maybe something like live as good citizens of the gospel or of the kingdom of God. And what Paul is doing here is Paul is drawing on the Philippians' understanding of their civic pride um, and duty as Roman citizens to explain to them how they should live their faith. So to appreciate what Paul is doing here, you have to understand Roman pride a little bit. So the Romans were very aware that they had created a great society, arguably the greatest society to that point. They had created a powerful empire, not arguably. It was the most powerful empire the world had ever seen. That was an objective truth. And they thought of their culture and their way of life as superior to all others. Now, being a Roman citizen, not everybody was a Roman citizen. To be a Roman citizen was a privilege, and it came with certain rights and responsibilities that were valued highly. And Philippi, the city of Philippi, was very loyal to Rome, and so it had been granted the status of a Roman colony by Rome, and that meant that everyone who lived there was a citizen, and they had a certain level of autonomy because they were so trusted. So they were, as these, Philipp- these Philippians were as proud of being Romans as the most patriotic American is of being American. That's what's going on here. So Paul says something like this. This is kind of paraphrasing. He's saying, you know how much you love your country and are loyal to it and consistently honor your responsibilities to it. Well, understand yourself that you are also a citizen of God's kingdom. So live with the same kind of love, loyalty, and consistent responsibility to God and to the gospel. That is kind of what Paul is doing. He's using their, their civil civic pride as an, a, a kind of a metaphor for how they should live their spiritual life. Now, I think if we really pin Paul down, he'd say they should do even better in, in terms of their faith than they would with their civic pride, but he's using that as an example. Now, Paul makes his case kind of passionately here um, because why? Because what we do matters. What you do matters because God has made you free. You see, God could have chosen not to make you free. God could have chosen to make all of us as people who always did the right thing, always loved God because we had no other choice, kind of robot-like people. And there's actually some logic maybe to God doing that because it's our freedom that's the cause of all the wrong that we do in this world, even the terrible things that we do. So God chose to make us free knowing that in our freedom we would do wrong. So why did God make us free knowing the terrible consequences of our freedom? And the answer is this, because God chose to give you a life that matters. And with a life that actually matters comes great responsibility. And that means that when you do wrong, you can hurt yourself and you can hurt other people. But it also means that when you do right, when you love God, when you care for people, it means that it is real because you weren't forced to do it. You chose it. That's what God wanted was people whose lives really mattered so that when they loved him and did something right, it was real. That's the kind of life that God has given you. You are not a puppet. You are not a plaything. Your life is not a joke. God has given you the opportunity to be something and to do things that really matter. 
and it's a privilege and it's an honor. So Paul says this, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Live in such a way that honors God in what you do, in what you say, and especially in how you treat other people. So the question is, is that what we're doing? Are we living in a way, are we conducting ourselves in a way that's worthy of the gospel all the time? Sometimes? Not so much at all? Because if we claim to be people of faith and we're not actively seeking to live God's way, then we are falling into the category of hypocrite. Now, I find that we're really hypocritical about our hypocrisy. <laughs> what I mean by that is that generally human beings don't like hypocrisy. We, we, we pretty much hate hypocrisy, right? And when we run into it, we point it out and we, we just don't like it at all. But as a people of faith, one of the things that I notice we do is we, we point out other people's hypocrisy and then we give ourselves a pass. A lot of times on our own hypocrisy. And I'm not even talking about the really blatant hypocrisy. Like, we can go out and find video of people just doing terrible things and claiming to be people of faith. I'm talking more about the hypocrisy of claiming the name of Christ and then just not even trying. So we, we point out the hypocrisy of others and then we give ourselves a pass for being hypocrites, so we're hypocritical about our hypocrisy. And then here's, here's something that I just think is so insidious about it. We claim the name of Christ, we don't really live for it, and then we turn around and we go, man, you know, I wonder why my faith isn't more meaningful. I think the church is letting me down. I don't think I'm getting fed. I'm not sure that the worship is touching my heart. And we never point it back on ourselves and say, am I actually living this faith? Because if I'm not seeking to live it, I'm slipping into inauthentic faith. Because authentic faith means consistently living like it matters. Because you know what? It matters. So Paul continues in verse 27, and he's urging the Philippians and us to embrace this call to live like it matters. And he gives us a, piece, a key piece of advice here. And the advice is based on the fact that life is so often not easy. In fact, life is often very difficult. And for that reason, Paul says, stand firm in one spirit. Because Paul knows that we're going to need to encourage each other, we're going to need to support each other if we're going to do this, if we're going to consistently seek to live in a manner worthy of the gospel. And right there, Paul's going back to koinonia. He's going back to relationships. He's going back to the fact that Faith is a team sport, which we talked about week one. And he continues, Paul says, for this reason, he calls them to strive together as one for the faith of the gospel. That word strive together is uh, the translation of a compound word. It's uh, soon athlantes, and we get the word athletic or athlete from athlantes. And the prefix soon means together. And so it's uh, the, the, the picture there is striving together in an athletic endeavor. That's what it's going to be like, he's saying, for you to, to live in a, in a manner worthy of the gospel. You're going to have to strive together like uh, a team trying to win a game. Because then, again, faith is a team sport. You're not going to be able to do this thing in the way that you should all by yourself. Verse 28, Paul mentions that the Philippians are facing some opposition. He doesn't really specify exactly what the opposition is, but we know historically that they were being persecuted. This is still a time when Christianity was illegal and there were violent persecutions at different points. And uh, Paul mentions in verse 29 uh, uh, that they're suffering, so we know that's going on. Um, and 
Paul's time in Philippians is recorded in, in, in Acts 16. And if you read about Paul's time in Philippi when he founded this church, you find that it was a rough go. Um, there was a point when um, Paul was preaching and a riot broke out because of the opposition against the faith. And they actually grabbed Paul and his associate Silas and they dragged them into the middle of town where they were stripped and beaten and flogged and thrown in jail. So it was tough going there in Philippi. And I know that we don't live, I know that we live in a place where that's probably not going to happen to us. We're unlikely to be stripped and beaten and thrown in jail for our faith, but we will face opposition. There will be people who will criticize us, maybe even mock us for our faith. There will be people who will stand against us when we seek to do what is right. So we will need to stand firm and strive together as one for the faith of the gospel, just like the Philippians. And the question is, is that what we're doing? We're supposed to live in a manner worthy of the gospel and we're supposed to do it together. Is that what we're doing? Now at the end of verse 28, honestly has kind of an uncomfortable feel to it, doesn't it? Paul says that the faith and the good conducts of the Philippians is going to be a sign to those who oppose them and they will be destroyed. And that just sounds awfully Old Testament God of wrath in our New Testament, Jesus loves everybody ears, doesn't it? It's hard for us. We don't know exactly what to do with that. But it's important to note that Paul is, is, is speaking of a Jewish heritage and a Jewish hope. Paul is talking about the hope of Israel that at the end of time, there would be justice and that those who have done wrong would be punished and that there would be salvation for those who trusted the Lord. So Paul is in this moment not so much actually speaking a, a literal statement about the destruction of their, their persecutors as he is reminding the Philippians that God is faithful and at the end of time there will be justice and there will be salvation for the Philippians. But I think we need to reckon with the fact that this is not totally a figurative statement. Paul's drawing a distinction between two paths here. And one path leads to God, it leads to the hope of salvation, and because of that, it sees our lives as have meaning, having meaning, and sees what we do as really mattering. And the other path leads away from God. And it sees death as the final word, as oblivion, as destruction. And because of that, our lives don't actually really count for anything. What we do doesn't actually matter. Those are the two paths that Paul's talking about. Now, Paul closes this chapter with some surprising words. I'm sure, they were surprising to the Philippians, and they're surprising to us, too, if we understand what they mean. Um, the words are to let the Philippians know that when they suffer for their faith, for, what, for doing what is right, it's an honor. I'm not sure that's how they thought of it. I'm pretty sure that's not how we think of it. It's for this reason in verse 29 that he speaks of suffering as something granted to them. Like it's a gift, a privilege that's been given to them. I think that's a gift that most of us would rather not receive. In Paul's mind, when we are so united with Jesus that it causes our faith and our actions to be noticed in the world in such a way that persecution begins to come to us, Paul is saying we should accept it as an honor to suffer like Jesus did. There's an amazing little moment in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 5, there's this moment where the apostles had been in Jerusalem and they'd been preaching the gospel and they'd been captured by the Jewish authorities and they'd been put in jail and they were whipped. Uh, and then the, the Pharisees told them, do not preach the gospel anymore. And they wanted to have them put to death, but they were worried about what the crowds would do. So they just whipped them and let them go. Uh, and it, there's this amazing moment it says that as the apostles left jail, it literally uses this word. It says they rejoiced. And the reason is that they, found, they were found worthy to suffer for Jesus. 
That's the disposition that Paul is calling the Philippians to have. That's the disposition that Paul is calling us to have. Now, I can't speak for the Philippians, but I'm pretty sure that's not where most of us are at. Despite the fact that some of us may think of ourselves as deep and mature disciples, and we may very well be in some, by some measure. But it means that we all have, no matter where we are, more work to do. We can always find that growing edge where faith is a challenge for us, where it pushes us beyond what we're comfortable with. And we always need to be pushing that edge to know Jesus more. So Paul sees suffering for our faith here as a badge of courage. And um, he has a point, doesn't he? Because it's easy to say and do the right thing when there's no consequences, right? When it doesn't cost you anything. But it is a whole different thing to say and do the right thing and profess the faith when there is a price to pay, especially when there is a high price to pay. And I want you to remember Paul's opening words, whatever happens, whatever happens, good or bad, Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Authentic faith means living like it matters consistently. Whatever happens on the good days when faith is easy and on, and I would say, and especially on the bad days when faith is hard. Because when life is hard and faith is hard, that's where so often what we truly believe is born out. So this is a great passage, and many times Christians, I think, don't fully grasp all that Paul is calling us to here, because we tend to limit what Paul is saying here mostly to our personal conduct, and that certainly is a very significant piece of what Paul is talking about. We're, 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 we're hearing it in terms of, I got I to gotta live right, I got to live God's way. And that, that really is true. Paul is clearly calling us to live consistently with integrity and moral values and conduct that pleases God. But Paul is calling us to so much more than that. Paul is calling us not just to behave but to use consistently this life that we've been given to do great things that honor God. That's what living in a way worthy looks like. It's not just behaving, but it's using the gift of this life to serve God in amazing ways because great things truly are worthy of the gospel. But when I say great, I want to stop for a moment. Because what is our measure of great? Well, remember what Jesus said, that the greatest meaning in this life is to be found in relationships, relationship with God and relationship with one another in koinonia. The greatest things that we can do in this life have impact on other people. So, you can climb Mount Everest or swim across the Atlantic Ocean. Somebody really did that, by the way, swam across the Atlantic Ocean. You could have seven Super Bowl rings, which Tom Brady now has, and those are all incredible achievements. But they are not truly great things from a kingdom perspective. Because they're not about loving, serving, and caring for other people. From a kingdom perspective, none of them is as great as participating in breakfast in a bag and feeding other people or volunteering at our tutoring center and investing in the life of a child or swinging a hammer with Habitat for Humanity or teaching Sunday school or praying for others or sitting with someone and telling them the story of how God came into your life and about the love and the grace of Jesus and how transformative it has been. Those are truly great things from a kingdom perspective. And here's what's so important about that. We can do all of those things. We can do those things 
I'm never going to be able to swim over the Atlantic Ocean. I'm never going to win a Super Bowl ring. And so if that's the measure of greatness, I'm disqualified without even trying. But that is not God's measure of greatness. So whatever good we can do on our own, it is multiplied when we work together. God is calling us individually, but God is also calling us to work together as a church to do great things, things worthy of the gospel. God is calling us to stand firm and to contend together as one person, to give our time, to give our money, to use our gifts and our talents. And the question is, will you be a part of that? I hope you will. Listen for God's voice because he is calling you to consistently live like it matters because it does. Amen. Pray with me. Lord, we are so grateful and humbled when we realize that you have indeed given us a life that matters that we have an opportunity to be used by you to make a difference in this world. And so we pray, God, that you would help us to consistently do that, to consistently live a life worthy of the gospel, one that uh, makes an impact on this world, that makes things better, that brings light. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and sing with us. What will it be like when my pain is gone and all the worries of this world just fade away? What will it be like when you call my name in that moment when I see you face to face? Well, 
I want to remind you that there's going to be some folks in the west wing of the church that would be ready to pray with you, to pray for you about anything that might be on your heart or your mind. Just a reminder, if you're newer to Orchard, we'd love for you to stay for, uh, for lunch at the meet and greet um, right over in the church library. People can direct you to that place. We'll begin in just a few minutes after we've had a chance to greet each other following the service. But as we go from this place, may we remember the call to an honor to a privilege to live this life in a manner worthy of the gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. <laughs>